All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us. We're just after six o'clock, so we're going to get underway because, as we know, uh, time is short. My name is Ross Westgate. I'm uh, from CNBC. I'm delighted to be able to uh, help moderate this panel today, averting uh, a lost generation. We've got some great people to talk about what was an extraordinarily uh, important subject. Uh, in Japan, it's called uh, fritas, a combination of freelance and German w word arbeit. In, in Tunisia, it's called hitis, people who roughly translated lean against walls. And in Britain, it's called neets. Young people not in education, employment or training. But the fact is, wherever you are in the world, um, in Europe, US, the Middle East, youth employment is a ticking bomb that in some cases has already begun exploding. In the UK, we hit one million unemployment in youth for the first time ever back in November. In Spain, we know that total unemployment is over 20%, but youth unemployment is 40%. And the ILL, ILO suggests that unemployment for the age group in total around the world is 24%. And we've seen the implications of that, of course, starting from this time last year with the Arab Spring. So what we're going to do today is see how the current generation of young people can reach their full economic potential despite the economic challenges that we're facing, particularly uh, with growth in the Eurozone and what we're, we're facing there. We're going to do this in a couple of phases. First of all, we're going to try and understand the potential of the next generation. How do their aspirations match the reality of what's available to them? And then also, the most important part of this discussion is going to be how do you tackle the youth unemployment crisis? To do that, we've got a great panel here and we've got some great global shapers. We've got Aria Finger from the Do Something organization. Welcome, Mary. Maurice Levy, uh, the CEO and chairman of uh, Publicis. Um, we've got uh, Orn Shakat al Kawazani, Prime Minister of Jordan. I said I'd get his name wrong, so uh, forgive me, Prime Minister. Um, we also have Juan Samavia, Director General of the ILO. Uh, we also um, have Peter Diamond, Massachusetts Institute of Technology here, and Mohammed Al Madi, the CEO of SABIC. Now, the first discussion, of course, is about how do you understand the potential of the next generation. But with the greatest respect to this panel here, and perhaps forgetting Aria for a moment, they're probably not the right people to tell us what the potential of the next generation. Probably the best people to do that are the people of Generation Y. And here we have at the front our global shapers, uh, Tamarka Mitari, uh, Olena Tregub, and uh, Baramano Connery as well from, from Mali. But first, I'm going to ask Geronimo Col Calderon, um, who is from uh, euphoria.ch. Just tell us, in your views, your generation, Generation Y, what is it that they have to offer to employers, to governments? What are their hopes, Geronimo? What are their aspirations from your point of view? Hey, Ross. Thanks for your question. Hey, everyone. Um, before I answer the question, I think this panel and, and this discussion is very representative of the problem we have right now and why we're not taking advantage of the potential of our generation. It's because we're talking about our potential and challenges of our generation, and out of six panelists, five are over 50. Um, it's, I believe if you really want to take advantage of our potential, you need not just to listen to what we have to say, but actually invite us to actively take part in decision making. I know this sounds a bit um, dangerous because sometimes we have crazy ideas um, but there is a saying that is everyone thought it was impossible and then someone came and didn't know that and just did it and the people who don't know that things are impossible that's our generation we're still dreaming you know we still imagine the things the way we want to have them we still haven't sold out so um, I hope that answers to some extent, to your question. It's a very good point you made this, about this panel. So Maurice. I'm here. <laughs> are, are you actually the right people? I mean, in a sense, you've got the power because you, you're, you're policy holders, you're running companies. But you've got to understand what these people hope and want for and, and what, what they can deliver. I, I think that the question is right. Uh, and uh, the first thing I did when I uh, received the invitation to participate to this panel was to ask myself if I was the right person to sit in that panel. 
And um, I'm not sure that I'm the right person. So we will see at the end if I'm ca I can contribute. But uh, clearly, it is a very important question. And um, the only thing I can say is that uh, in our company, which is a relatively small uh, company because we have only 50,000 people around the world, 56, uh, the average age is 31, slightly less than 31. So the, the fact that we can manage a company of that size and uh, the vibrancy of the company is really linked to the young generation. The other aspect is that um, uh, our key uh, uh, feed for thoughts, for innovation uh, is coming from that generation. So uh, we are in tune. Uh, am I the right person to sit down here and speak? I'm not sure. And if you wish, we can <laughs> trade. I'm ready to sit here and you take my seat. I have absolutely no problem. Uh, regarding the young generation, the Y generation, as we are in, in, a, in a time where uh, people like very much to, to give uh, notes, uh, I would say that it is a triple A. It is adventurous, it is uh, altruistic, and it is able. They are skilled. And we should not uh, think that they are not ready. This would be wrong. And I would, I, I would like to add an E, because they are also ethical. And the way they are pushing us to be more ethical is very important. While my generation, particularly in Europe, is much more a double A. Mm. It is apathetic and anesthetized. So you see, I'm totally with you on that front. Okay, Maurice, thank so. you for that. Yeah, and you, you said something there that was quite important. You said Europe. And so we're, we're going to be talking about Europe, Middle East, and the United States, and they are three separate areas. But one, let's, let's concentrate on Europe. What are, what are the hopes and the aspirations? What, what do European youth have to offer? And, and what is it that organizations can deliver? Can, they, can we meet their aspirations? I think that the point of voice participation in the decision making is at the core, not just of youth, but much, much wider. What has happened in the world in the last couple of years is that youth have interpreted that much wider sentiment in society. About 100 protests, 1,000 protests worldwide in 82 countries, 1,000 protests in cities in 82 countries. It's led by youth, the most highly educated level of youth we've had, and the most technologically savvy. And when they look at the world today, and I think that this is what I'm listening from what you're saying, is we don't seem to be a priority, together with all of the others that are excluded. So I think that this is a much wider process which, which the young people today are at the head of saying, look, if we take a look at the unemployment levels, ours is two, three, and four, and five times that of adults. If we take a look at the education we have mismatched, if we take a look at the participation we have non-existent. So how do you want us to have trust in this society in which it's clearly so we are not a priority? And the question that you're posing and that we all have to answer together is how do we change the mix of policies? Because if we continue this way, the issue of the lost generation is going to be real. It's going to be not just a lost generation, but a society that is so you know, affected by the fact that we can't respond to these questions that the consequences are going to be much higher. In some places it's political, in others it's socioeconomic, in others it's cultural. In the end, you know, the need to think together about all of this is essential. Our job as international labor organization is to bring together business and workers and civil society and governments and say, look, let's use dialogue to address these questions. We are, our conference this year is going to deal with youth unemployment in, January, in uh, June, and we are doing a global consultation mm. with youth. We're going to have a youth forum before that, but they're going to be in the room proposing solutions also. These are minor things. You ask us the question, I'm telling you the types of things that we're doing. The problem is much deeper. Yeah. There is no understanding of the lack of priority that young people's issues have today beyond jobs in general. Uh, I, I, let me ask just one of the global shapers here. Do you, Eleni, you were talking about you, you're, you're into technology. Do you feel your generation thinks that there are the right opportunities 
for them? Um, well, um, first of all, I think um, when we talk about Europe, um, um, it's, we have to make clear which region we are talking mm. about because I see that there are regional divides in the world concerning um, young generations. So if we are talking about lost generation in Europe, this is one thing, but there are lost generations in other regions in the of the world that are much more lost than European young generation. And um, your question is about uh, what are the opportunities for us that technology brings. Well, definitely because we are more savvy in technology than the older generations, we use it for our benefit and we basically can make our voice heard using the, uh, heard this technology, but very often um, all these discussions and all this bragging, it stays online and it's not really realized in uh, real world. So in some way, this technology is also absorbing our energy and effort, but in other way, it mobilizes us for action. So it's like the double effect and it's uh, hard to say which prevails, mm. essentially. Well, you, you, and you mentioned technology, which, which brings us on to the next part of the region, because technology undoubtedly for young people has played a huge role social media uh, with the Arab Spring in the, in the Middle East. And, and the hopes and their aspirations, of course, in the Middle East are very different, Prime Minister. The, 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 the people in the Middle East, I mean, there it's, it's not just about they haven't got jobs, it's about can I feed myself, is, there's a sense of hopelessness. So give us your sense a year on now with the Arab Spring and these still the ongoing troubles we have in your part of the world. What do your young people want? L let me start by saying that uh, there is a constant uh, theme in Arabic and possibly in Islamic culture that there will always be a mis misunderstanding between different uh, generations. Uh, a misunderstanding because each, because times are not static. And this is often expressed in the saying, bring up your children for a time different from your times. And it is also expressed in another saying um, by 16th century, uh, Egyptian uh, jurist, which says uh, the wisest of men are those who can best interpret their times. Uh, this is a, another way to say oratio oblica, that there will be a misunderstanding between different uh, generations. And I think that is uh, also a testimony to the fact that what looks from the outside as a static thing, in fact, may carry much more change and transience than we uh, think. But when I came uh, to office three months ago, uh, and I was in the process of forming government, I was really struck by how much this gap, uh, how big this gap is, uh, is in Jordan. I cannot say for the rest of the uh, Middle East. And I'm not sure that there is a division between people in the Middle East and Europe, and uh, probably there are divisions within those uh, regions. Um, it, it is not a question of uh, unemployment. Unemployment is very important in, in a country like Jordan. Um, it, it, it is, as you said, much deeper than that. It's, it's an identity sometimes. Um, uh, question. I don't want to say an identity crisis that is too strong um, uh, um, a description of the situation. Uh, and I say it is not just a question of unemployment because Jordan is one of those countries which is paradoxical in that our, uh, as a government, our most important job now is to provide employment at a time of a sharp contraction in the economy. But at the same time, we have something like uh, 600,000 foreign workers. So, I mean, it is, it is sort of structural also. Uh, it's deeper, uh, a population that was essentially until a, a generation or two ago nomadic or uh, in a transhuman state of uh, affairs, all of a sudden acquiring uh, education. I don't want to, to jump to the question is, 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 it, is it fair to say, though, that um, in the Middle East, where we've seen the Arab Spring uprising, it, it, it's stemmed as much from a sense of they had no control, young people, no sense of a future, no sense that they had a control of what their future was going to be? 
What, the Arab Spring? And, and employment and having a job and having the prospect of having a job is part of that. This, this, this must be one of the reasons, probably one of the more important reasons. But causation uh, links in, in, in social sciences are not as clear as we would like them to be. And sometimes I think the causes of the Arab Spring are economic. Uh, they appear to be so. I've been judging by Abu Azizi in, uh, um, in Tunisia. Others say this is part of uh, a reaction to a, a state of stagnation political and now economic okay. on top of that and humiliation on a, on a systematic way. So when this uh, implosion took place, it was commensurate with uh, the length, the duration and the intensity of the humiliation. I mean, the Arab world, human rights in the Arab world were much better in the 50s than they were in the 70s and the, uh, the 80s okay. and the 90s. Um, is it a cause of... Uh, a very uh, basic human uh, quest for justice and uh, an idea to, to accept, to not to accept injustice? Um, is it just uh, economics? Um, is it a case of uh, rising expectations followed by a sharp decline? All these are okay. possible ca uh, causes. There's a lot of things happening. linked. Uh, yeah. Mohammed Ahmadi, I mean, it is, it is even different though within the Middle East. Uh, I mean, Saudi Arabia has one of the great benefits. It has a lot of money. I mean, that, that's very helpful. Yes, you're absolutely right. But uh, the situation is different from Jordan. Mm. For example, in, uh, in, in my country, there is many jobs that are occupied by uh, foreign labor. The problem of the young generation in my country is a mismatch between the education and the job market. And uh, uh, it, it will take really a good collaboration between government, major employer like my company, and also the academia to come up with uh, a way to bring this uh, education to the level of the job market. Uh, secondly, it's not enough to have good education. You have to really have the right values. And when I talk about values, the job, job ethics, uh, you have to uh, bring uh, the young people to really realize that the job is about working uh, environment, uh, uh, respecting the work uh, ethics uh, of an organization, coming early in the morning, going late in the evening, and respecting the rules uh, of the organization. Th this is very important for us. And I think uh, you need the old, the young, and, and those in the middle to really run an organization, run a country. Uh, yes, the young people have energy and productivity, mm. but also the old generation have wisdom that both of us, we can work as mentors, you know, for the young generation and really uh, to act like a support system for them uh, for the job market. And you, and you raise, I mean, you raise a very good point there. It's not just about... The, the employers and the government being ready to take on young people, it's actually, and this is what we're discussing, is whether the young people themselves have the attitudes or the skills to involve. And it's not just geographically that's different, Aria, it's also across social structures. If you're part of so, certain social structures in the United States, actually, are they equipped, are they emotionally equipped? Are they able, if there was a job, to be able to take it? Right. Well, first I want to say thanks to Maurice for saying how wonderful my generation is, because he's right. Uh, if we look at recent studies from the United States, 89% of young people in the U.S. want a job that changes the world for the better. So these are young people who are going out there and saying, if I'm getting a job, whether it's at a bank or an NGO or an academic institution, it better be environmentally sustainable, but better have diversity practice in place that I like. And if they're not going to have that, they're going to start their own venture, whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit, and make sure that they're being a social entrepreneur so that they leave a positive impact on the world. And I think the sort of three A's with the ethics involved is one great thing that my generation has to provide. But as you mentioned about the different demographics that we need to look at, 
in the United States, the unemployment rates aren't as dire as in some other countries, but when you break it down by demographics, you'll see that young African American males have twice the unemployment rates of other categories. They're more prone to go to jail, less prone to graduate from college. Only 15% of African American males in public schools are even ready for college. And so in the US, while we're solving these unemployment problems, let's also make sure that we're looking out for differences in terms of race, economic class, and sort of bringing everyone up instead of just focusing on the people on the top. Is it possible? Is it possible to raise every, all, all boats together? Well, I think you can tell I'm a pretty positive person. <laughs> so absolutely. I mean, I hate to be cliche, but the real issue here is education. And if we educate our young people, I absolutely think that we should leave no one behind. Peter, great time to bring you in education. Education I is critical for many dimensions and needs to start very young. And the US is letting down large numbers of young people, inadequate preschool, uh, a lot of bad schools. I view the education story as more complex over the issue of breadth versus narrowness, over the issue of more depth, which you can get with narrowness, that you don't get with breadth. The ongoing education, the diversity in jobs, what kind of education will give you a satisfying career? What kind of education will put you in the place of experimenting out in the world? Because that's the way you succeed. You think of the job process as an experiment that requires evaluation and the mindset of experiment. And the problem we're having in the US with the high current unemployment is a problem that's terrible for the young. They don't just lose earnings now, but they're not accumulating experience. Experience, average earnings rise sharply from leaving school into your mid-30s in the US. And that is heavily driven by experience, not just experience acquiring skills in the job, but experience moving from job to job, finding the right niche for yourself. So I view the US as having an unemployment crisis right now. And we have a debt problem. And my concern about Washington is it seems to act as if we had a debt crisis and only an unemployment problem. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, and, and the thing about demographics is we know today how many people there are going to be in 15 years. And if we continue the stats today, we know what percentage of those people are going to be unemployed if we don't do anything. You talk about education. Let's, let's look at some of the solutions here. And I'm going to throw up Germany. Europe's in a recession at the moment, yet German unemployment is down to levels that they haven't seen since 1992. So is the German model the right model? Do they have the right ability to tie up the educational needs of their people with what their industry and their services need? Is that, is that the model? that actually everybody else should be copying. Um, Jeff Joyce, you're C of Manpower. Is that, is that the model? That's a great question. In fact, I had a, a chance to uh, speak with the chancellor about that, because she had asked me the question. And I said, right now, there is no doubt about it. Germany has an incredible model. But when you look at education, employment, youth unemployment, <laughs> each country has its own ecosystem. And you just can't pick one up and place it into another and expect it to work because it has social mores associated with it. So, so what it really comes down to is we have a bridge between trying to get people into the workforce, particularly young people, and basically, in some ways, a distrust about am I hiring the kind of skill that I want? And the real question is, is how do you bridge that faster? And it's getting them into the workforce because they're missing that growth early on that's the experience. And, and, and we can all be social entrepreneurs, but it's also sometimes hard for everyone to be a social entrepreneur because it doesn't drive the basic facts of it. So, so I'd actually like to pose a question and say, there is a problem. Let's have some fun with it. Old people may not recognize what young people have, but how can young people add to the conversation to say and articulate what I can add in a way that makes it compelling? Because I think that's a critical part of it. Aria? 
Well, I mean, I think that it's, it's very clear that I, I work with two million young people on a regular basis in the United States, and one of the things that we do is we focus on um, volunteerism to create leadership training so that young people can clearly articulate that while I might not have years' experience in a job, through the bone marrow donation drive that I ran, I learned how to organize people, I learned how to public speak, I learned how to lead my generation, and I'm going to take all of those skills that I can into the workforce, and I couldn't agree more that the jobs isn't just about income. If we're not building the skills for these young people, they will never be able to re-enter the workforce and you know, be the production people that they should be. Maurice? Uh, in Germany, I think that there is two uh, elements to the resolution of the problem of unemployment. The first one is uh, the fact that historically, uh, Germany has been always uh, helping with the apprenticeship and the fact that uh, people were integrated in the companies very early on. So they were familiar to the job, familiar to the company, they understood very early and when they were learning in this environment, it was relatively easy then to make them an offer and to find the right person. The second aspect, which I believe is probably the most important one, is the fact that Germany has had its aggiornamento uh, with the Agenda 2020, uh, with, uh, 2010 with uh, Gerhard Schroeder and what he did. And I think that as long as we have economies which are supporting a lot of costs and where labor costs, social charges, are uh, an impediment to productivity and to competitivity, there is no way that company will create jobs. And I think we have to be honest. And if we want to create jobs, we have to do both. We have to help uh, employment and to open a, a, a real chapter of employability in order that the people who we are responsible for, we give them not only a job, but the education and the training all along the time they are with us in order that when there is a restructuring, uh, an accident of life or whatever, they are ready to take over their jobs. The second thing is that we need to be competitive. As I'm speaking for Europe. And today, uh, the, the vast majority of the corporation had to deal with this issue and the only solution yeah. they found was offshoring and outsourcing which was the easy way, but not the right one. What is the right <clears throat> one? one? Let me, I think that you're perfectly right that you know, every country has its own ecology. I think that the, what we can learn from Germany is that every one of the things that Maurice mentioned were agreed through social dialogue. Employers, workers coming together at the enterprise level, at the sector level, national level, the government participating. And social dialogue analyzing your country's reality, coming together in very different realities, but agreeing on what is the best way of going about in that particular country, I think is essential. And that has to do with the other question of, you know, how is it that you make the labor market work? Well, you don't have a solution. You, you, you can't say, you have to reform labor law and everything will change. It doesn't change. What you need is something that is applicable to different realities. But there's one reality that is applicable everywhere. We now have 200 million unemployed. Four out of 10 people are young people. You have 400 million people coming into the labor market in the next 10 years. How are you going to produce those jobs? You have to do the educational part, but it's not enough. You need to have an economy that produces the volume of jobs that is going to be able to cope that. And we don't have those economic models today. And one of the biggest challenges and I've been, you know, that the world of Davos has is to see how is it that business you know, is part of a new model. We discuss the contents of labor and others in order to produce the types of jobs that are necessary, the volume of jobs that are necessary in the future. This is the essence of the problem. You can solve the educational part and you can wind up with lawyers driving taxis in developing countries. And not to speak of what is happening now in Europe, you know, 45% unemployment in Spain. That means that you have a pretty flexible labor system. If you can go from, from, 
from where they were to 45%, or you went from 8% unemployment to 20% unemployment in a couple of years. So the problem is not the flexibility or inflexibility of the labor market. The problem is how do we agree that job creation is the central objective of economic policy. What we've had now is that you concentrate on things that are essential, but you don't concentrate on jobs well, as you, you mentioned that, Peter, but isn't, isasn't the Fed, isn't the, hasn't the Fed just last night come out and, say, and effectively said they're going to direct their monetary policy to job creation? Isn't in an election year everybody making job creation the number one policy that their administration is going to deliver? Well, there's a lot of diversity in the U.S. as to what sorts of things create jobs. And I think it's important to recognize that all around the globe there are short-run problems and long-run problems. Long-run problems are where the education matters, where the labor laws matter, where the environment for business, uh, corruption, the quality of the court systems, the quality of the underpinning commercial law, all of those things matter for the profitability of business and so for the ability of business to hire people. They won't do it if it's not profitable. And so that profitability has to be built into the structure. And Germany spent years overhauling its labor rigidities to have more fluctuations. We read in the paper about the guild systems in Italy and Greece and the difficulty of reforming them to open up jobs. So I think there's a, a basic economic framework. Around that, we have a short run problem. Some countries have such a severe debt problem that they're badly handicapped in dealing with that. Austerity is terrible for growth. And so the issue is to do as little austerity as you can afford and still deal with the debt process. And I call it a process for countries like the US where we have significant debt, we have an eventually unsustainable system, but we don't need to do any austerity right now. We should be investing in the things like infrastructure that themselves create jobs, but more important, create a more valuable economic environment. And not only can we afford it, but it's cheaper to do it now than later. If it's stuff the economy needs, better to do it now. Um, Prime Minister, I'll just bring you on here. If, if you don't have the big budgets, how do, how do you go about creating the jobs? How do you create that partnership between government and business and get the right legislation? Well, our hope in Jordan, of course, is to attract foreign uh, investment, basically uh, from the, the Arab world and, and the Gulf in, in particular. We think that... Uh, uh, the situation is opportune for this type of uh, uh, investments to come to Jordan. Uh, the, though we, we, we have uh, to go through some austerity measures, we are also making uh, sure that this does not bring the economy to a standstill. Um, it's a question of where do you find the, that delicate balance between the two opposite uh, aims of government. I suppose that is a, a dilemma or maybe a trilemma even that faces all, uh, all governments. Um, but if I may just revert for a minute with your permission to the question of education, I understand that it is a long-term one. I mean, in a country like Jordan, I think it's very important. Um, what we have had is uh, an expansion in education, but in nature, in general, there is always an inverse relationship between quantity and quality. And I think that we, if we don't do something about it, then you know, all that creation of jobs and we will only work in the short uh, term, but in the long term, it would not be based on a solid foundation. I think in the long run, that is really a very important uh, thing. Okay, there are, there are two issues I want to, I want to raise in terms of uh, regulation and policy, and let's knock these on the head, uh, first of all. Uh, Tijan Tiam, the CEO of Prudential, said today in an earlier session here in Davos that the minimum wage legislation, he's talking about Europe here, is the enemy of young people. It destroys jobs. The second point is, is also about retirement age, because we're talking about economic budgets. Many countries in Europe are raising retirement ages. And if you're stopping people from retiring, are you excluding 
jobs to young people. So let's deal with that last one first, uh, Juan. So raising retirement age, every government in Europe is now raising their retirement ages. Is that making youth unemployment worse? No, the, 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 all the studies that you have around that issue show, show the studies were the other ones. When you reduced the age, that was done 15 or 20 years ago in some countries, there was no effect whatsoever on youth employment. So the linkage is not there. So we, we can put it, all the studies show that we can put that aside. Everyone, everyone else happy with that? <laughs> Jeffrey, you say? It's true about the studies. The challenge is, is that it brings an emotion. You can talk to the French student who says, I want my parent to retire so I can take their job. Well, it, it isn't. But it doesn't happen. It, it, but there's, it, it's true. But, but we have to educate more sure. that that's really not there because that's part of the youth challenge is, is they're feeling as though they're being stopped because other, there are blockers in the labor market. Well, let's ask, Juan. Is that, do, do you, when you see retirement ages being raised, do you think, well, hang on a sec, well, my fellow, my fellow youth generation, where are they going to get the jobs from? Do you have that feeling? Take the mic there. I can only speak for myself. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to take someone else's job. I want to create my own. And I think that goes, you know, along the things that Aria has been talking about. I and mean, I think we need to make a difference uh, between, uh, you know, there is, there's this high talent. And I always keep hearing about, you know, the, this uh, fight, this war for talent that's happening. That's right a great now. Davos phrase, by the way, the exactly. war for talent. Yeah. So there it is. And I think companies are losing right now because the talent, because we have these different um, values, we just decided to do it on our own. I've met a couple of young global leaders um, who were at big companies and they left and they did their own thing. So that's one thing. So I wonder, it's in your own interest to change, to adapt the rules you impose, like working hours, you know, make that more flexible. Mm -hmm. Think about what you have, how, it's it, really to follow up of, uh, your comment, Jeffrey, I think the essential problem, I just tweeted that before, is there's a lack of communication. Because our generation, we're like, Guys, you're not offering us the jobs we're seeking, you know, and then we come to, we, although we get a job, we come, we're not really motivated, you know, you invest in us and after two years we take off to another company. Um, it's not productive. Everyone is losing out. And you were pointing at us and saying, wow, you're lazy, you're not motivated and so on. Instead of sitting together and think about what's the new frame, what, what are the new jobs that are, that are adapted to our needs. Mahalo, so, but just, just come back on that. I, I just would like to add a point here, I mean, uh, about the whole debate. Uh, investing in young people, some people consider it a cost, and we consider it an investment. It takes a long time to bring a young person, take him, mold him in leadership development, take him until he's a productive age. Uh, and many people do not have the patience to do that. In my company, for example, we take people from high, sco from high school, and we send them for education to get higher education in the right skills we want them to, to be in. Then we bring them back. And then we put them on the job with mentoring, with people trying to help them. We have an academy to do that. We spend money on that. And you are not going to see their productivity maybe three years later. And I think if we change this mindset about this and consider it an investment, uh, it will not pay for the long term if we consider it as a cost. And uh, my company is investing a great amount of money. How, 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 how do you, to Geronimo's point, how do you meet expectations with reality and make sure this investment doesn't result after you've given them all this training, after two years, as he says, oh, actually, this is more than I thought it was, so I'm going somewhere else. You lose your investment. They don't have the career they thought they was. How do you close the gap? Well, I, I have to involve them. I have to bring him, uh, I have to give him the job immediately and put him in confidence and, and, and have him producing in the first day. Maurice? Uh, I would like to come to first uh, the reaction of um, uh, the, the fact that we are reducing uh, the workforce in, mm. and, and that we will create uh, jobs. For example, we had uh, 35 hours in France, which is uh, very famous. And uh, when this has been created, everyone was believing that as people will work less, we will create more jobs, and that uh, uh, the end result is that we have created more unemployment. Because uh, in our world, 
jobs are creating jobs. The more we work, the more we create jobs. That is the reality. So if we can keep the uh, elder generation and create jobs for the newer mm. generation, this is the perfect system. Well, and what I'm about minimum wage? I want to come on to minimum wage with you. Is, is, is Tijan Tiam right? Minimum wage legislation is the enemy of young people. But th that is one of the problems we have. Uh, another problem we have, for example, if I'm putting tomorrow an ad saying that I would like to recruit young people, I, I can be sued because I have not the right to say I'm going to recruit young people. I have to put an ad and whoever is coming and the right person who is coming, I have to hire for the job if he is right for the job, he or she. I cannot make a discrimination by age or anything. Regarding now uh, what you have said about frustration, we are investing a lot with young people and we are recruiting uh, out of the schools, the university, people who are starting up with us. And uh, sometimes they stay and they stay long and they build a career. Sometimes they are frustrated because uh, it's an organization, it's heavy, they don't see a fit. And sometimes we have another problem, which is uh, that um, the, we, we are not offering exactly what they want. And they feel frustrated, they go elsewhere and they have the same frustration. Why? Because there is, uh, and this has been said, a mismatch. A mismatch between uh, the educational system the fact that uh, in my country, for example, uh, it's very hard to speak uh, to the education uh, organization and to say, administration in fact, and to say, okay, these are the kind of people we, we need, we want, the skills we need. And they will consider that this is an insult to their mission of education. And if they are creating people who are highly skilled in sociology, and that nobody will use them, they will consider that this is right because this is their mission. So we, we have that mismatch. And one of the examples, which is pretty clear, when you look at unemployment, not only in my country, but in many European countries, you see that there is a lot mm. of um, uh, jobs offered who are not taken because there is a scarcity of talent and skills for those jobs why there is a raising unemployment. So I think that if we want to address the issue, we really have to open a dialogue and to say, okay, and to have all the parties, the unions, the education, all the people who are involved and say, okay, how, how are we going to fix the issue? We, we can't fix the issue only from the side of the corporations, as good as we can be or as bad as we can be. You, you, you raised something there that was just struck a chord because the last time I was in this room I was doing a gender debate and um, what came up in that was positive discrimination something they tried in Norway was they said we're just gonna make it a law we're just gonna make it a law 50% of your boards 50% of your task force have to be women so can positive discrimination work for youth employment could we pass laws where we say X percentage of your company should be people of a certain age if the law passes, it is fine. In our case, we have not that issue because in our case, we have the vast majority of our population who are under 30. The average age is 31. So to get an average age of 31 with uh, a CEO of my age, I can guarantee you <laughs> that uh, you need to, ha to have a, a very large number of people under 30. I, the second aspect is that we have a majority of people who are uh, a woman, and we have uh, our own positive approach to diversity. We believe in diversity, we invest in diversity, we train people, we educate people, we do a lot of things in order to tackle this issue. So we do what laws permit us to do. But well, I uh, think well, let, our let, example is not good Yeah, no, enough. I know. Well, let, Ari, let's bring, let's bring you on that point. I mean, would, would young people like to think the I businesses just add one yeah. thing. The majority of our board is women. Okay. Well, that's fine. Um, I mean, would you, I mean, is that you know, is that something actually? You think if companies, are, if everybody's thinking, and and maybe are compelled by law to think we have to employ as many young people as possible, um, to make me, a difference is, or not? 
Yeah, to me, that is not the solution to the problem. I think that's one of those, you know, quick fixes that we can put in place that we think is a, you know, panacea that will solve everything. And again, it's, it's the skill mi mismatch. Mm. While I agree with Geronimo that certain young people will take a job for two years, then a job for one, then a job for three, that's not true of all young people. That's, that's true of the lucky young people yeah. who are very skilled and have a good education mm. and have those choices. So let's be very clear about what segments of young people we're talking about. And, and it's the long-term unemployed are the ones that have least education. Exactly. Have come from least economic background. So what is, the minimum, what is the minimum standard of education? And a lot of people in the UK leave school at 16. So what is the, you know, what is the minimum standard of education that they... Uh, John, you, you, you've looked at this. What minimum standard of education that young people should have that at least gives them some skills to get some kind of job? And, is it, and do they need apprenticeships? I mean, you know, where do we go? Uh, Ross, it's an interesting question, but it also takes us back to the country by country mm. model. Um, the German example is actually quite compelling. There are examples where children from certain economic groups in Germany are tracked into skills jobs, craft jobs, uh, vocational type jobs, say at the ages of 10, 12, 14. And if they actually reach a certain level of acumen, at that point, they might be put back into a more formal school, or what I call more traditional school, in order to demonstrate it. So I think part of this is not trying to be too prescriptive and assuming that everyone is coming from a middle class or upper middle class or working class background and looking at it in a much more segmented way. I'd like to get Global Shapers have been listening. Do you have any thoughts or questions you'd like to put to anybody here? Um, to my yes, I, I think... On a youth unemployment is quite natural you know, phenomenon and a very structural issue because the population is growing and the consumers love something more efficient and convenient. For example, I love Twitter and I'm tweeting and I can deliver a message to millions of people. But imagine 100 years ago, how many people need to be involved to deliver message to millions of people? So it's quite natural that an unemployment happens in this, at this moment. And of course, people start to, uh, no, sorry, the company first start to hire less people before they start to fire people. So of course, unemployment um, happens among the youth generation. So what, uh, in my opinion, what we need to think is we, as a consumer, need to create the new value, which we really think, think something very cool, wanted to pay money to buy that, but it's more a bit labor in the, uh, in, in, uh, intensive, which can create the jobs for the world. If we, so, and also, so it's the market side, and if we see the, the, the supply side, also we need to think how we can incentivize the, the, the companies to, to create the jobs. If they just pursue the, the profitability, it's quite natural we have less jobs. Ross. Yep. I would just like to follow on that because I think that one dimension of, of the way we have to look at work, which is, is what's the value of work in society? I'm getting away from the nitty gritty of how you create jobs. And I'm afraid that the way work is looked at is work is a cost of production, so as low as possible. The worker is a consumer, so hopefully has power to consume since wages have not followed productivity for a long, long time and they've kept here and productivity has gone up, you know, people get indebted. And you know, so you supply what you should have gotten through wages linked to productivity through debt. And then we forget completely about the fact that work is a source of personal dignity and it's probably one of the principal sources of personal dignity because you approve yourself in work and everybody in this room proves itself in work. Second, it's a source of stability of families, household, in whichever way people want, choose to live together. You know, an unemployed family is a very unhappy family. An unemployed household is a very unhappy family. And it produces all sorts of social consequences. Never measure them, never take them into account. We never link those types of problems with lack of jobs. And third, you know, work and decent work, quality work, is a source of peace in the community. So I would just like to make these points, because if we treat work exclusively as this mechanical phenomenon of you invest, you create jobs, you do this, we're going to totally miss the picture. The only way 
we're going to be able to get to the real issue, which is we are not producing enough volume of jobs, is by, because we come to the conclusion that if we don't, the social impact on society is enormous. And this is, this is the real issue. And how is it that we all agree, political parties in government and opposition, mm. uh, society in general, how is it that we say, look, we're going to take a collective decision to revalue the significance of work in society? Because I think that today it is devalued. We have, devalued, and yet, and yet, we have devalued the dignity of work and the value of work in society. And yet every politician you speak to around the globe will tell you in any interview they are concerned about employment. They are concerned about creating jobs. But they're going to so talk about it in two terms. Cost of production and people having more to consume. And that's, the, that's precisely mm. my point. If we don't understand that this has to do with the fabric of society and the quality of the societies we live in, and that consequently as much more reason what he does or the prime minister in what he does, you know, and the professor in what he does and what, you know, what you're doing and your work, how we all come together to say we have to revalue work. How can we have transformed work, which is of the essence of our identity, into a mechanical economic product in which it's just cost of production and the person is just a consumer? Yeah. And that's the reality of today. Yeah, I agree completely. Okay, yeah. good evening. <laughs> I'm Birama from Mali. So I would like to talk about education in Africa. Mm. But first of all, let me say that in America, in Europe, in developed countries in general, you are really lucky because I, I believe you have a good educational system. Your students have access to many facilities, to computer labs, to libraries. In Africa, it's different. We barely have access to computers. Mm -hmm. I would like to have a positive energy, but uh, it's really difficult to reach our full potentials. In uh, public schools, for example, Classrooms can take up to 150 children. In our universities, in Mali at least, students have been using the same books for more than 15 years. So how can we get better skills mm. and meet the, ex the expectations of job markets under such uh, conditions? Birma, can I ask you a question? Uh, about that, there is a perception that technology, modern communication, the internet, mobile internet, will help in places like Africa. Is there evidence that it is? Is that, is that part of the solution or not? Yes, but the cost remains very expensive and only few people have access to internet, to computers. So maybe governments I uh, need to work on that. Anybody on the panel wants want to respond to the particular challenges? He's yeah. putting an a, a enormous problem on the table. Yeah. It's enormous. And uh, I, I, I know that uh, for those countries, uh, the situation is absolutely terrible. Uh, there is a story that has been reported uh, by somebody marching in uh, Africa. So he was very pleased. He was explaining that he has been marching for three years and he went through a lot of countries in Africa and he has been accompanied by a boy for uh, a moment. And uh, he was going from a village and the boy was saying, OK, I will go with you because I'm going to school. And after one hour, he said, but where is school? It's just here. Second hour, where is your school? It's just nearby. It took him three hours to get to the school and three hours back. So when you see this, you can only be stunned and say, we have to do something. Obviously, individually, we, everyone mm -hmm. does what he can. But there is certainly a, a massive problem where uh, by our situation look really a little bit the situation of rich people compared to that. Mohammed? I think it's going to take a collective approach between technology, uh, major uh, companies to come together and bring technology, uh, a cheaper uh, computer, for example, 
and uh, to be supported by investment from companies like myself and others uh, to bring this uh, 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 computer to countries like your, your country to where they can uh, educate themselves via the internet. And uh, there are uh, machines that are very cheap and uh, it can be subsidized. Um, the good news is technology does tend to get cheaper. Yes. So I, I, and I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just quote this one too because I thought it was fascinating. Um, Jared Lyons from Santa Charter was in a session today and he, and he tweeted this and he says, uh, in IT, they reckon, this quote came out, for every job lost to IT, so offshoring or whatever else it is, 2.1 jobs are created. So um, you're nodding your heads, you agree with that. I just thought I'd put that stat out there because we have this view that technology takes away jobs. Today, here in Davos, they're suggesting that's not the case. You, John, we've got the last five minutes. You've got a question. I'd be interested in running a model by the, the panel, and I think particularly starting with you, given that you work with so many young people. Um, I don't want to use the term national service. I want to use the word, let's call it work for life or working for life. Let's say that the, there was a UN resolution, 130, 140, 150 countries agreed that between the ages of 15 and 24, there had to be a mandatory two-year placement that the government in that country and certain corporations and certain educational institutions would require. And one could do one of 10 things. Teach, work in logistics, plant trees, go to the army, and basically, people would get a network, a sense of self-esteem, the dignity of a job. They develop a sense of self-confidence. The only argument I hear against this is, well, you can't force people to do that. Um, I'd be interested in knowing whether, how you think young people would react to that. I'd be interested in knowing how people would react to it. Because my own personal view is that people would, in many countries of the world, develop a sense of camaraderie, a, sen a sense of network, and a sense of self-confidence and some skills that would allow them to move on. But, and, I, and if, if it, I'd be wondering why people don't look at that model compulsion, more seriously. Uh, compulsion, we've got, we've got literally three minutes left, so I think this will be an excellent point to leave this debate on. So let's get very quick answers. Uh, are it, a UN resolution, compulsion to do something for two years? I think compulsion to do something is great. I think that you can absolutely make young people do that, and I think they would welcome it. Just anecdotally, we have five high school students in our office who are interning. They're 15 years old. They go to a terrible public school in New York City. And the two days a week that they get to volunteer at our office, they say are the best things they've ever done. They get to interact with employees. They get to build skills. I would absolutely support you. Let's make it happen. Maurice, very quickly. I fully agree, and I think that we should uh, generate more kind of uh, uh, not compulsory, I hate the word <laughs> compulsory, but voluntary. And I think that... It's a bit like a Greek uh, haircut. It's sort of, it's not compulsory, it's voluntary, but it kind of no, is compulsory. No, 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 I think we can convince the people to do that. I, I hate the idea that they are forced to, and they don't believe that this is a good if thing. If you sell the benefits of it, enough people sign up, yeah, Prime okay. Minister. Um, well, on this occasion, I have nothing, I'm not averse to the use of the word compulsion. I think it'll be a good idea. Juan? In fact, there is already in the UN uh, a voluntary program. It's called UN Volunteers. So we can, we can certainly build on that. And on and a, and a final point of the whole debate, we began by saying that not enough importance is given to young, to youth. I think that, let's not forget, while we're ending this, that the priority to youth and creating the conditions for them to be part of not only the discussion but the decisions is, I believe, absolutely essential. In different countries, in different ways, in different cultures, in different modes, but absolutely essential as a global objective that we all have to push for. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Pia? I think that that is a plan that fails to recognize the heterogeneity in the population. It would work terrifically for some people. It would be wasted years for other people. And I think as an idea, it's a bad one. Okay, and um, so, so it was very... That, that's actually the American reaction. But remember, people... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the reality is people, people are going to live till 80 or 90 years today. So you're talking about two years out of their life to provide a period of nurturing. And I think you, you're providing a very academic 
mm. analysis rather than a practical one that gives someone real work experience. I and want, we're talking about experience in the workplace here. Some, I, I, want, sorry, I want to leave the final word with where we started. Let's leave the final word on this with the younger people in the room. Juan. Thank you Go very on. much. Uh, is this what you were referring to, how they react when you make a proposition? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think, I think um, you know, the compulsory is not going to work. But if you make this accessible for one part, and Ari and I, we were working on that, and it's, I have facts. I can show you how people who volunteer, I, that volunteer in my organization, find a job days after they finish the project because it valorizes them. And they have studied sociology, you know, what they were passionate about. But they have been com become competent through a voluntary commitment to do that. So that is something really, I think, that is huge to promote. And one last thing, and also at other panels I was, um, we always talk about education. And then we have fantastic people representing incredible, great universities. But what about the teachers? You know, what about the teachers? I believe they're so essential, they're so important, you know, and they're not valorized. And they are not the best people. It should be the best people who, who become teachers. Mm -hmm. And I feel that would be great if next year we could have some teachers. It'd be, it'd be great if, e if everybody in Davos this year, maybe next year, gave up their jobs and became teachers for a year. Maybe that would be part of, you know, something that, that, that would help. They, they gave up their salaries and became teachers, and, and that would be part of it. I want to thank everybody here. It's a very important subject. I, I think what, Juan, what, what struck me was this idea that we all need to value work in a completely different way. Maybe if we start that process, it takes us to some of the solutions that we just talked about there. But uh, thank you all very much for your time.